Thank you, Jay. Good morning, BRCC. It's good to be here. Chris, thank you for the opportunity uh, for me to speak this morning. Pastor Andy sends greetings from Trinity Park, wants you to know he's doing well, and he thanks you for your prayers. Becky and Andy led VBS at Trinity Park this past week using materials that BRCC uh, gave them, and so they appreciate that. And my grandson, Hudson, had a great time with BRCC at the summer camp this past week. What if Jesus appeared to us right now in this room as the leader of the spiritual army assembled here and he gave us our final marching orders? Would we ignore him or would we pay close attention to him? Would we obey his command or not? What would he say to us? Oh, wait, we know what he would say because he gave final marching orders to his disciples before he ascended to heaven. In Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Jesus said, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. The one thing most on Jesus' heart, the one thing he most wanted us to do was to make disciples who we would teach to obey his commands. But before you can make a disciple, you must become a disciple yourself. What is a disciple? BRCC exists to inspire people to become wholehearted followers of Jesus. Matthew 4.19 gives Jesus' call. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus invited people to come follow him. A true follower of Jesus was to become his disciple. In Luke 14, 27, Jesus said, And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Following Jesus and being his disciple are linked. To follow Jesus means to be with him, to connect with him, to have a personal relationship with him. A disciple comes under Jesus' authority. Jesus is both Savior and Lord. A disciple is being changed by Jesus. I believe that a wholehearted follower of Jesus is his disciple. But the Bible gives us more details about what a disciple is in the Gospel of John. Jesus gives us three characteristics there of a disciple. And I'm going to spend a longer time on the first characteristic. The second and third will be much shorter. And then we will return to the process of making disciples. Let's look at the characteristics of a disciple. Then, then we'll later return to making disciples. Number one, a disciple of Jesus studies his word and applies it to his or her life. In John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What does it mean to hold to Jesus' teaching? Well, that would mean that we know his word and we apply it to our lives. It would mean that we believe God's word to be authoritative and we are obeying God's commands. I am a child of the creator of the universe, the king of kings who redeemed me, who saved me from eternal hell, who forgives me, who knows everything about me and has a purpose for my life, who gives me an abundant life, who helps me with my problems. Why would I not want to spend time with a God like that every day? Forty-seven years ago, I made a commitment to read the Bible daily. It is the single most important habit of my life. Daily reading of the scriptures coupled with prayer is how I maintain a vibrant relationship with Jesus. By intentionally deepening my relationship with Jesus, I am better able to hear the promptings of the Holy Spirit throughout the day. I usually read one chapter per day, and then I focus on one or two verses that jump out to me. I call it fishing. 
And so I ask questions about those verses. I look for a cause and effect relationship. I may look at cross references on those verses or read those verses in another translation or a paraphrase or look at a commentary. I'm going to spend extra time thinking about one or two verses in the chapter that I read. On the other hand, my wife Kathy reads through the entire Bible every year from Genesis to Revelation. She covers a lot of territory because you have to read more than three chapters per day to read through the entire Bible in a year. She's not really a fisherman. She's more like a water skier covering a lot of territory. <clears throat> are you reading God's word regularly? If you are too busy to daily spend time with the one who created you, redeemed you, and has a purpose and plan for you, then you're too busy. Something needs to change. If Jesus was standing next to you right now, would you, would you really tell them, Tell him that I don't have time to fit you into my schedule. Please examine your schedule and make reading the Bible daily a priority. Ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart as you read God's word. You will deepen your relationship with Jesus when you read the Bible daily. But we can't, we can't just fill our heads with information from the Bible. Matthew 4.4 4 says... Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. We need to live by God's word. Our lives must be transformed as we apply God's word to our lives. Howard Hendricks, Bible professor from Dallas Theological Seminary, says, Bible study without application is abortion. A true follower and disciple of Jesus does not merely know information about Jesus and his teachings. They know Jesus personally, and their lives are being transformed by Jesus and his word. In John 14, 21, Jesus said, Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Wholehearted followers of Jesus demonstrate that their love for him is genuine by obeying his commands. As I read the Bible and pray, I am meeting with Jesus. While I am reading the Bible and praying, the Holy Spirit may convict me of a sin that I need to confess. I may be impressed to help a particular person. I may be impressed to try and have a spiritual conversation with someone or even share the gospel. I may be able to clearly discern God's will for a particular situation or issue that I'm facing in my life. I may be led to apply God's principles to an area of my life like finances or my giving. There are verses that I pray for myself to deepen my relationship with God. Let me share a couple of those with you. Psalm 73, 25 is, Whom have I in heaven but you? And being with you, I desire nothing on earth. Psalm 63, 1. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. And one many of us know, Psalm 42, 1 and 2. As the deer pants for streams of water, may my soul pant for you, O God. May I thirst for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? When we pray scripture back to God for ourselves, don't be surprised when God answers your prayer. If you've never tried it, I highly recommend it. The Bible is not merely ink on paper. It's powerful. Hebrews 4.12 says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates 
even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The Bible is the authoritative word of God, and it will change your life if you are receptive to it. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. In the Phillips paraphrase, it says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. God's word has radically transformed my life. The Bible has shaped my worldview. Do you have a biblical worldview? We all need to have a biblical worldview. Have you caved into the opinions of the world on social issues? Or has your mind been transformed by what God's word says? Colossians 2.8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. I have often prayed this verse for my grandchildren, that they will readily detect and reject the unbiblical ideas, concepts, and philosophies of the world and that they will establish a solid biblical worldview. Okay, moving on to number two. A disciple of Jesus genuinely demonstrates love to others by their attitudes, words, and actions. John 13, 34, and 35, Jesus said, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. All men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. To love others means to think about how we can meet their needs. How can we help them? How can we serve them? We need to be unselfish. We may need to give of our abilities, our money, or our time. Philippians 2, 3 and 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. My wife, Kathy, is very unselfish and has a lifestyle of helping others. Her radar detector is tuned to sensing the needs of others and responding to help because she loves people. The Lord... <clears throat> uses the Lord uses her example to challenge me in this area. Helping others is how we demonstrate our love. If Christ has transformed our heart, then there will be a transformation of our thoughts, words, and deeds. BRCC exists to inspire people to become wholehearted followers of Jesus who love God love the church, and love the world. That is an excellent description of a disciple of Jesus. Can other people tell that you love God, love the church, and love others? Number three, a disciple of Jesus bears spiritual fruit. Jesus said in John 15, 8, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Bearing fruit is evidence that we are Jesus' disciple. I believe that the fruit we are to bear includes both the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of witnessing and making disciples. The fruit of a a disciple is another disciple. We can't convert anyone. That's That's the work of the Holy Spirit. But God has chosen us to be his instrument or vessel to share the good news, the gospel, with other people. Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, said, success in witnessing is sharing Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. Part of witnessing is to live our lives in a way that demonstrates love to others. 
But witnessing also includes having spiritual conversations with others, sharing our testimony, and sharing the gospel. Sharing our testimony includes three things about our life before we came to Christ, how we came to Christ, and then the changes in our lives since we became a follower of Jesus. No one can argue against what God has done in your life. And we need a method to share the gospel in our spiritual tool belt. Colossians 4, 5, and 6 says, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Are you taking the initiative to have spiritual conversations with lost people? I would love to tell you about my experiences talking with lost people about Jesus. It is my favorite thing to do. Are you equipped to share your testimony? Are you equipped to share the gospel? When was the last time you talked with someone about Jesus? If you don't feel equipped, I encourage you to talk to someone who knows how to do these things so you, that you can learn and be trained. So let me summarize the characteristics of a disciple in the Gospel of John. A disciple of Jesus studies his word and applies it to his or her life. A disciple of Jesus genuinely demonstrates love to others by their attitudes, words, and actions. And a disciple of Jesus bears spiritual fruit. <clears throat> we just finished talking about Jesus' description of a disciple from the Gospel of John. Now I want to circle back to the command that Jesus gave us after he rose from the dead and before he ascended to heaven. Jesus commanded us to make disciples, not just converts. Not just to be a disciple, but to make disciples. We are to help other believers become wholehearted followers of Jesus. Jesus told us to go and make disciples as he knew that was how the good news would be spread to the nations. This was his strategy. This was plan A, and there is no plan B. And discipleship, which is spiritual mentoring, is how it would be shared from one person to another through relationships. Discipling is done by one life rubbing off on another in the presence of Christ and his word. Essentially, it follows Jesus' example of how he invested in the lives of the 12 disciples. The life-to-life -life element is about intentionally coming alongside another person, starting from wherever they are spiritually, and sharing God's love with them in ways you think will resonate intentionally praying together, studying the Bible together, and doing everyday life together. Now let me share an illustration that pictures the disciple-making process. This diagram is borrowed from the navigators, and I have modified it slightly. <clears throat> This diagram shows seekers, converts, disciples, disciple makers, and equippers. A mature disciple should be able to lead a seeker to Christ. A disciple maker should be able to take someone who's earlier in their faith or less mature in their faith and help them to become a mature disciple. An equipper is someone who can take someone who's a disciple and help them by training to become a disciple maker. The first step is evangelizing the lost to produce converts. If someone comes to Christ, are you happy? Yes. Are you satisfied? No. Gary Cooney, author of The Dynamics of Discipleship Training, and the dynamics of personal follow-up said, after following converts in their church for two years, only one out of six was still active in church. They changed their methodology. They began to do follow-up of every convert. Two years later, five out of every six was still active in church. 
evangelism is the starting point of making disciples, not the end point. Follow-up is done by someone, not by something. The modern parable, parable of the baby illustrates this. The parents prepare for the arrival of the new baby. They prepare the nursery. They prepare food and clothing. Finally, the big day arrives and the baby is delivered. They bring the baby home and say, we are so tired from preparing for this baby. We need a break. Let's take a vacation. So they gather all the baby's clothes and food around it and they leave on a two-week vacation. When they return, they go to check on the baby and it's dead. They said, what a poor baby. It didn't try. It wasn't sincere. It didn't care. It refused to eat and clothe itself. This was a bad baby. What was the missing ingredient in this story? It was a parent, a close relationship with a mature person who demonstrated love. The same is true of a spiritual baby in the church. We can say that we entrust them to God, but God entrusts them to us. Follow-up is primarily relational, not educational. Spiritual growth is not automatic once someone becomes a believer. Initial follow-up, though, is just the first step in establishing converts to be disciples. That's just the early stage. There's a lot more work to be done after that. Here's how the Christian organization Christian parachurch organization called the Navigators defines discipleship. A disciple is someone who believes in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, intentionally learns from him, and strives to live more like him. Discipleship is a widely used word to describe a journey of spiritual growth. This growth happens as a person comes alongside another to witness to them, pray, with them, study the Bible with them, and fellowship with them. How does BRCC describe the growing disciple? BRCC exists to inspire people to become wholehearted followers of Jesus who love God, love the church, and love the world. Well, the next step is equipping disciples to become laborers or disciple makers. So that means to take someone from not just being a disciple, but being someone who's a disciple maker. That's our job description that Jesus gave us. We need to become disciple makers who can do this same process and repeat it. Disciple makers have ministry skills. 2 Timothy 2.2 describes what it looks like to disciple or mentor others in everyday life. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. In this verse, there are four generations of spiritual reproduction. Paul to Timothy, Timothy to reliable men, and then reliable men to others. God's plan is for us to multiply spiritually, to reproduce spiritually, he doesn't want us to be spiritually sterile. Discipleship can occur in small groups or one-on-one. -on -one. I don't think it is either or, but both. But whether it is in small groups or one-on-one, -on -one, it needs to be intentional with a purpose-driven goal. I have been in small groups for decades. Kathy and I have discipled younger couples using small groups several times. I've been involved in one-on-one -on -one training for 40 years. Generally, more rapid progress can occur one-on-one. -on -one. Let me tell you how I became a disciple maker. In 1981, a man named Dale Pruitt met with me one-on-one -on -one early in the morning every week for a year. Dale Pruitt taught me deeper Bible study methods, but always with a view to applying the scripture to my life. He deepened my prayer life. He had me praying for the nations. 
He taught me how to give my personal testimony. He taught me how to share the gospel. He taught me how to follow up a new believer. And he taught me not just to be a growing disciple, but to be a disciple maker. In fact, he developed me into an equipper so I could train not only disciples, but I could help produce disciple makers as well. And so the next year, in 1982, I began to meet one-on-one -on -one and do the same things with a Greenfield junior high teacher that Dale did with me. We met for a year. And the next year, I met with a scientist from Eli Lilly. And the next year, I met with an attorney. And the next year, I met with a guy who was the head of maintenance at an apartment complex in Indianapolis. And the next year, I met with a guy who did maintenance at a Kroger bakery. And the next year, I met with a, an orthopedic surgeon. And then the next year, I met with a cardiologist, every time doing the same thing that Dale did with me. Then the Lord called us overseas, and I met with a high school teacher, and then a factory manager, and then two engineers, and then another doctor. And then when we came back to the States, I continued to look for guys who were fat, faithful, available, and teachable. And so among those that I discipled was a college student, a high school student, even a fifth grader. Last year, I met with a guy who's a nurse practitioner, and this year with a guy who's a urologist. I taught them the same things Dale taught me in 1981, how to grow as a disciple and how to make disciples and how to become a disciple maker. Dale never met most of the people that I witnessed to or that I led to the Lord or the guys that I discipled. But Dale gets a fraction of the action because Dale multiplied his life by training me. I love being a part of Jesus' strategy to make disciples. When I disciple other guys, I often feel the Lord's presence and his pleasure. I'm not kidding. In this room, there are a number of people at various stages in this diagram. Seekers, converts, disciples, disciple makers, and equippers. Where are you on this diagram? That's the big question for this message today. Where are you on this diagram? Maybe you're a seeker, just curious. If so, thank you for coming today. Perhaps you are at a point in your spiritual journey that you are considering the next big step. Would you like to know how you can have a personal relationship with the God of the universe? God offers forgiveness from shame and guilt. He gives love, peace, joy, and fulfillment. 51 years ago, I realized that I had a head knowledge about God and the Bible, but there had never been a transformation of my life never a change in my life. So I repented of my sins. I turned away from my sins and I put my faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord and became a follower of Jesus. I've followed him ever since. It was the best decision and the most important decision I've ever made in my life and I have absolutely no regrets. Let me explain God's rescue plan. Originally, God and man were in a perfect relationship with each other, but then man sinned. Romans 3, 23 tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I've sinned, you've sinned, we've all sinned. But then there's, there's a penalty for sin. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. And that is not just that we are gonna die physically. There's a spiritual death, a separation of man from God, of us from God. Hebrews 9.27 says there's going to be a judgment just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. And if we are separated from God in this life, when we die, if nothing has changed, then we will stay eternally separated from God in hell and there'll be no escape. But God doesn't want that to happen. He loves us. And he has a rescue plan for us. In Romans 5, 8, 
It says, but God demonstrates his own love to us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins as our substitute. He took all of our sins on him. And on the third day, he rose from the dead, showing victory over death and sin. But a lot of people try to get to God by other ways. They may try to get to God just by going to church or especially by doing good deeds. And yes, we should go to church, and yes, we should do good deeds, but they won't pay for sin. So that's why it doesn't work. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us that what Jesus did for us is a free gift. It says, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so no man can boast. Well, how do we receive this gift? It's by believing in Jesus and receiving him. In John 5, 24, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He's crossed over from death to life. And John 1, 12, speaking about Jesus, when it says, yet to all who received him, to those who believed on his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We need to believe and receive in Jesus as our savior. Revelation 3.20 is a beautiful picture of Jesus waiting for us to say yes to him. It says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. Whoever hears my voice and opens the door, I will go in and eat with him and he with me. If God is speaking to your heart this morning and you are ready to admit your sins to God and put your faith in Jesus, I will lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Pray after me. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I repent of my sins. I'm turning from my sins. I believe that Jesus is God and that he died for my sins and rose from the dead. Take away my sins and forgive me. Right now, I put my full trust in Jesus as my Savior and the Lord of my life. Come into my life and change me. Lord Jesus, I will follow you. Thank you. If you just prayed this prayer, then I encourage you to tell me, one of the pastors or elders, after the service. Now let's take another look at the Making Disciples diagram. Maybe you're already a believer. If so, that's great. But are you a growing disciple of Jesus? Or are you somewhat passive in your walk with Jesus? Are you just coasting? Are you in love with Jesus and his word? Do you read his word regularly and apply it to your life? Is it obvious to others by how you spend your time that you are a follower of Jesus? Do you give generously to the Lord's work? Are you an ambassador of Jesus Christ? Do you talk to both believers and unbelievers about your faith in Jesus? Do you have a biblical worldview? Do you have biblical convictions that govern how you live your life? Are you intentional in your spiritual growth as a disciple of Jesus Christ? If you have put your faith in Jesus but aren't really a growing disciple, then I encourage you to make the changes to become one. You will have no regrets. If the Holy Spirit is prompting you to make some changes or make some commitments, then I encourage you to pray right now and tell God what you will do. Maybe you look at this diagram and said, I'm a growing disciple of Jesus but maybe you're not yet a disciple maker who can do the same thing to help someone else become a disciple. If so, I encourage you to get the training that will be required for you to become a disciple maker. Talk to one of the pastors about how you could do that. Maybe you've already received sufficient training that you are equipped as a disciple disciple maker then the only question is are you doing it or not if you're doing it great if you're not start doing it don't be a spectator be a disciple maker wherever you are in this diagram keep 
moving forward. Don't, don't be stationary. Don't fall back. Let's close by saying Matthew 28, 19 together. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What is Jesus' plan for reaching the nations? Making disciples. Friends, get a vision of what God wants to accomplish through your life and do what God wants you to do. I promise you, God wants to accomplish far more for the kingdom of God through your life than you can imagine. He's done it for me. If God has spoken to you about something this morning, then don't leave without telling the Lord the commitment you need to make. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, for those that put their faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord this morning, thank you. Help them to grow and become established in the faith. May they receive follow-up. Protect them and encourage them. Please multiply the number of growing disciples and disciple-makers at Brookville Road Community Church. Speak to the hearts and minds of each one here today regarding the next step that you want them to take. May they be obedient to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. May each one of us make your priority and strategy of making disciples our priority and strategy. Give all of us a passion for making disciples. I pray these things in the wonderful name of Jesus.